Well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. It's a beautiful day outside. I know it's kind of starting to cloud up a little bit, but you know, I got out there and on my way across town this morning, that sun was shining and it was beautiful. The, the music that was on the radio was just absolutely awesome. And so it just, it was a great start to the day. And I was just, as I always do, as I'm coming across town, I'm, I'm praying in the car on the way across town. And, and as usual, somebody cuts off in front of me. But instead of getting upset, I said, hey God, bless that person that they'll come to their senses and quit running stop signs. And, and so, you know, it, it's kind of what you choose to do with your life, and, and your life is made up of a whole bunch of choices. And one of the nice things is, uh, as we go through our study of the Truth Project in here, we talk about a lot of different topics. And uh, so some of the things are, you know, really come into play, and it's a great reminder for me as we're going through the study of how to ground ourselves in Christ so we don't have the stuff of the day and the stuff of the world mess with our heads and take us off course. You know, I, I could have chose this morning to, you know, go down the path of, of road rage and upset because somebody ran a stop sign in front of me, but I didn't. And so your life is full of all kinds of great choices. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I kind of started off a little bit about the Truth Project, and, and we had our study uh, this this last week on philosophy and ethics. And yesterday we had Orange Track Racing here, and we had a small but mighty crowd that was in here, and we had one little boy, Ethan, that was uh, in here, and I gotta tell you, he, he was just juiced. And he was winning yesterday, and man, I'll tell you what, he was, he was just full of life, and he was energized. And I just looked at that, and I said, you know, that's the way we all ought to be. Let's let the little things in life really energize us instead of letting the stuff of life drag us down. And so that, uh, yesterday I had a devotional that we do, and I, I did it on, kind of on philosophy, on what a life philosophy is. And years ago, I made the choice to uh, come up with a philosophy, which I had heard, and so I borrowed it and took it on for myself, which is I choose not to lose. And so if you choose not to lose, you have two choices that come out of that. I choose either I'm going to win at what I'm doing, or I'm going to learn from it. See, the word lose didn't come into that situation. I'm going to choose to win or I'm gonna to choose to learn. And so therefore you keep that positive and it gives you a growth opportunity out of whatever bad may come of it. You may not win, you may not cross that finish line first. And so Terry raced a car, man, I'll tell you what, his car just smoked down the track. Mine just kind of, it was a Mini Cooper. And it just kind of <laughs> went all the way down and got down to about three quarters away from the track and it just decided it was gonna stop. So didn't even finish. But still, I learned that that's not a car I want to race against that car Terry's in. So you learn from the experience. So you didn't lose, you had that growth and that learning opportunity instead. So it's, life is made up of a whole bunch of choices on what you choose to, how you choose to look at your life. So this Wednesday, 7 p.m. right here, we're going to have our Truth Project tour, number three starts, and it is on anthropology. Who is man? And that's kind of a really neat thing to go through because there's, there's a lot of different guesses on what's going on and what happened in the past and, and some people who have kind of led things astray and the evidence has come back to show that well, maybe that's not quite right. So it's kind of fun. We'll take an in-depth look at the anthropology of who is man Wednesday at 7 p.m. Then, June 11th, we're kind of jumping ahead, looking a little bit ahead. We have Orange Track Racing back in here again that day, but at the same time, our neighbors across the way over here um, with the family room are having a family fun day out here. They are hosting it. They asked us to come alongside them, and so we'll have our doors open in here and 
be able to kind of hand some things out. And we were talking about that Wednesday night a little bit. And uh, Carla came up with a couple of good ideas on what we could do as well. So uh, I think we're, it should be a really good time. It gives an opportunity for people to kind of come in and see us, although there'll be a big track down the middle of the place. But it sees that it shows that we're kind of diverse at the same time. So we're looking forward to that. June 11th, uh, have that out here. They're going to have food vendors, band, bouncy houses. You know, I'm really looking forward to that bouncy house. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe not so much. But a good time, and it's family fellowship. So it's, it's good, clean fun, and it's something that people should be looking forward to. So as we start our service off today, our call to worship that uh, Pastor Terry chose comes from Proverbs 23, verse 7. And this comes from the New King James Version. And so it goes, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And so we have to think about that. It's a little bit deep. Um, if we look at the surrounding passages in there, it's talking about uh, not just taking things at face value. And so ultimately, who people are defined by their hearts and not their words. And that is really, really, uh, I think, important for us to grasp that concept. Uh, because ultimately, what's in their hearts then defines their actions. And so words are easy. You can say anything you want to out there, but really what defines who they are comes from their actions, comes from their hearts. Spoken words can deceive many, but the actions of the heart will always show through. So I wrote that last night, and, and I was kind of thinking about this, and I was kind of going through some of my uh, books and things, and that verse in, in Proverbs speaks to us of what governs our minds and our hearts and our actions. Don't let your hearts envy sinners out there, but always, always be zealous, be full of life and love for the Lord. Because if we put the Lord in our hearts first, then the stuff of the day and the bad stuff will kind of roll off to the edges. There is surely a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off if you keep your heart centered on God. If you keep your heart centered on Jesus. Because He's got a plan for your life. A perfect plan for your life. We get off track when we let ourselves be led astray. So these two verses that we had talk about focus. We either focus on people, places, or things, and in this case, that verse talks about sinners, or we focus on the Lord. See, life is really about focus. So what do you focus on in your life? Well, let's work out in prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for the opportunity to gather freely and openly here this morning to hear the word that you put on Pastor Terry's heart, and we ask a, a complete and total blessing on him today as he delivers your word to us. Let it sink into our hearts. Let it overflow us and let us live it out in the next week as we go out into the world and take a hold of that and make it a part of our philosophy for living our life going forward with you by our side, hand in hand, as you designed it. Thank you, Lord God, for all of the things that you bless us with. Lord, for those who can be with us here today, for those who are who are ill or who are injured, Lord, we ask your healing to be upon them. Those who are grieving loss, Lord, we just lift them up to you. We lift them up into your care and comfort. And Lord, for those who are just kind of stumbling through life and they need your direction, Lord, we, we ask that you would help us call them home to you. Help us to be your hands and feet here on earth so that we can bring them back into your heavenly presence. So, Lord, we just thank you that you've given us this opportunity to gather together in your name, to be blessed and to bless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it beautiful outside? It's like 67. God is good. Well, uh, as Mark said, we're going to continue with our uh, the Truth Project uh, sermon series that we're basing on the Truth Project group study that we're going through on Wednesday nights. And so today, as we continue that, um, 
we're looking at the different aspects of life and how they tie into a biblical worldview. Now last week, Pastor Mark talked about veritology. And he answered the question, what is truth? And I didn't say it last week, but boy, I sure had a movie line stuck in my head as soon as I saw that. Something about you can't handle the truth. Well, this is a truth we can handle. And he, he talked about several different things. And um, for many, unfortunately, their worldview is simply my perception is my reality. So however I perceive it is what is the reality of things. And in this day and age, people don't even bother to look into things. So like we talk about studying the scriptures so we can learn. People aren't even looking into the, the issues of the day to find out what is truly happening. They just go off what somebody said to somebody else to somebody else to somebody else so it's like you know 10 times removed and so they're upset about something that really there's nothing to be upset about because it's like do y'all play the phone game when you were a kid operator yeah i, I took the kids through in youth group through a <coughs> variation of that a hybrid of that so we told them the first one and then they told the second one the second person had to draw what the first person was saying and then the third person had to take that picture and figure out what it was without any explanation and say it to the next person. And every other one all the way around, it, I don't remember what it ended up being, but it was not even close. And that's what, that's what happens when we don't investigate. And that's what this series is about. It's about you investigating. I mean, we've, we've seen uh, the Case for Christ movie about Lee Strobel's life. He took the time to investigate. That's what we're after. And listen to this, Arsene Sproul, he defines a biblical worldview as truth is defined as that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God. Not perceived by you or me, but by God. So ultimately, as we get further into the sermon today, we're gonna to be talking about how a person's worldview is how each of us sees the world. And with that in mind, here's a question. It's rhetorical. Nobody has to answer. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. How do you view the world? And a little bit deep step further that, what lens do you use to see the world? So if your lens is not right, you're going to see the world askew. When I took off this morning to come to church, I'm driving and I'm looking at my glasses going, everything's blurry. And, and, and it's like, that doesn't make sense. So I took my glasses off, oh, things were a little bit right and better. They're dirty. So they were blurry. If our lens isn't right, we don't see the world right. So when we think of that lens, when we think of how we see the world, have you been taken captive by the things that other people say or the things that you see, but maybe don't investigate? That's our first point today. Have you been taken captive? Now, if we think about the things of this world, they can easily take us captive. You're watching a show. Who, gets, who has a TV show that they absolutely love and they're just drawn into it? I mean, it's just something they got, got to watch it every week. There's shows like that. Or maybe it's a movie. I mean, I remember when Carissa and Marissa were younger. Um, there, I can't even remember the name of the movies. I'm not going to give it any credit by saying But there's a vampire movie, group of movies. And they just love these movies. And it was all fantasy and all this. But sometimes that fantasy can drive our reality. There was a guy who wrote some books back in the 50s and 60s. And it was all fiction then. The problem is he started to believe his own fiction. And a cult was born. What lens? And whether you realize it or not, we are in a spiritual battle 
every single day. Now, when I walk through the doors into this space, I feel safe. I feel the presence of the Lord. I feel the Holy Spirit. I step outside and I start to feel the weight of the world and that influences us. False religions and secular philosophies are out there and they have grabbed a hold of millions of people and have captured them, leading them down the wrong path. And there's many paths, but they ultimately, they're going the wrong way. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 26. He says, again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Uh, like what Mark was just talking about with that person out on the road, right? But, so, we must be kind to everyone. We be, must be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. That's not it. He goes on and says, Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. They've been held captive by Satan. Timothy, now what he was doing, he was out there, he was helping those who were confused about what truth was or what truth is, right? And Paul is advising them. Paul's like his mentor. And he's advising me and saying, and, and to all who teach God's truth, we need to be kind and gentle. Every single day I see opposing groups. They get up and each other's, I'm sorry, I don't want to have somebody else's spit in my face as you're trying to group, come, have a conversation about something. Let's come to the table, let's have a conversation. Let's be open and willing to hear the other person's viewpoint without getting upset. Handling it, being kind and gentle and patient. And then, when it's your turn, explain the truth to them in a kind and gentle and patient way. Because if we come across as attacking, are they, do you think they're even gonna listen to you? Good teaching never promotes quarrels or foolish arguments. It never promotes it. Whether you are teaching in Sunday school, leading a Bible study, we're preaching in church. Remember to listen to people's questions. I've had several conversations on the way to church before where I've listened to conversations. And we might not have the same viewpoint. But it's a conversation. It's an opportunity to share ideas. And it's fruitful. We must treat each other respectfully. If we do this, those who oppose us will be more willing to hear what you have to say. And maybe, just maybe, they'll turn from their ways. And we are commanded, commanded by Jesus, to proclaim the gospel to everyone. They aren't going to listen to us if we're standing on a street corner yelling at them. It's important that we never assume that those who are caught up in the world's ways of seeing things are irretrievably lost. God's message, God's word of salvation is for everyone. To think that someone is irretrievably lost is to fall into Satan's trap. And ultimately, that's his false teaching. Satan's false teaching leads us to a scriptural warning against hollow and deceptive philosophy. Now these hollow and deceptive philosophies can be found just about anywhere you look. Pick up a book, pick up the paper, pick, turn on the, the news, turn on the radio, look on the internet. Lots of this hollow deceptive philosophies out there. But listen to what Paul wrote to the Colossians. In 2.8 he says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies 
and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. See, Paul's letter to the church in Colossae was in response to news that many of the believers there were adopting beliefs that were contrary to the gospel. A lot of them were falling back and they were grabbing the Old Testament and they were looking at all these Levitical laws and they were falling back into that, forgetting that the grace of Jesus that we get from Jesus' death on the cross is enough. And so they started to struggle. They struggled with their former beliefs and with the salvation that we have through Christ. And this was a warning to them, not just to the church in Colossae, but to all Christians. The New Century Version puts that same verse this way. It says, be sure that no one leads you away with false and empty teaching. That is only human. That's the part I like about this version of it. That is only human. Which comes from the ruling spirits of this world and not from Christ. The ruling spirits of this world being Satan and his followers. Now in the New Century Version, empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense are translated as false and empty teaching that is only human. In the Amplified Bible, it goes on to say this, it says pseudo, pseudo intellectual babble. Okay, say that three times fast. Pseudo intellectual babble. So pseudo intellectual, what does that mean? That means someone who wants to be thought of as being intelligent <coughs> or knowledgeable. Look at me, I know all of these things. Reminds me of Cliff Clavin from Cheers. He used to spout off all of this stuff at the bar when he was at, uh, you know, on the show. And none of it made any sense. It was nonsense. But he made it sound really good. Well, what? how about Babel? That's kind of Cliff Clavin, too. To speak in an incoherent and meaningless way. So, these are things that we're being taught to stay away from. Now, in a little bit, we're going to go into the philosophy a little bit further, but in, in this moment, in this time right now, the Greek word philosophia would have covered everything from metaphysics, and, the, and that's the metaphysics of Plato, to the religious teaching of cults. The cults. And in this verse, Paul is not necessarily condemning philosophy because he was a philosopher himself. He was just condemning the empty philosophical speculation that stands against the good news. He is condemning teaching that credits anything or anyone or combination of the two that is not Christ in looking for the answers to life's problems. Now, there are many man-made approaches to solving the problems of life that totally disregard God. Go to the library, go to the bookstore, go, you know, go anywhere you want, you can find all these help, self-help books. None of them have anything to do with God. And they all need a strength. Now, on Wednesday night, we saw a clip from uh, Carl Sagan. Anybody remember Carl Sagan? Show Cos that he did a mini-series called Cosmos on PBS. He was an astronomer and he was a proponent of scientific naturalism, which is a philosophy. It's a false philosophy, but it's a philosophy all the same. And by all accounts, based on his own words, he didn't actually say it, by all accounts, though, he was an atheist. But to ask him, he would deny being an atheist, which never made much sense to me. He held the worldview that the cosmos is all there is, or ever was, or will be. Here he is using something called assumptive language. Now, assumptive language is a powerful and dangerous form of expressing knowledge. It is a type of language that often gets used by salespeople. And they use it to get the customer to say yes. They sound really positive. And like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Right? You need this. 
This is why you need it. We have the best product. We can get it installed the fastest for you and it'll last the longest. Sounds really good, but is it all true? It's a subject language. And so the customer is assuming that it is true. And we hear this in churches today. Pastors stand up at the pulpit and they preach this message that people go, oh, wow, yes. People aren't taking it back and going to scripture. They're not picking up the Bible and seeing for themselves. And Mark and I will say this until we're blue in the face. Pick up your Bible and go through the things that we talked about and discover them for yourselves. Hear how God perceives his word in the Bible. Now, it's interesting, uh, Carl Sagan's widow, which this has been his third wife. She said this, Carl meant exactly what he said. He used words with great care. That tells me that he was calculating. So when he said something, he knew exactly what he was going to say and how he was going to say it so that he could draw people in to his way of thinking. And his worldview, and we, we saw it, it was kind of a blur, and I don't have it up here today, but it's called the Cosmic Cube. That was his philosophy, because, you know, the cosmos is all there is, or ever was, or ever will be, so everything is in this box. And this philosophy says that the material world is it. These chairs, they're it. The clothes you're wearing, that's all there is. You can get more, but there's nothing beyond that. It's kind of a hopeless philosophy. And the other piece of this is, is that based on that philosophy, nothing exists outside of that cube. Now we're told that the universe is infinite. So I'm trying to figure out how this all fits in the cube. Because the cube is going to end somewhere. And if we're putting everything in a cube, that means, what else are we doing? We're putting God in the cube. We're limiting God in our thoughts. And when that happens, we not only limit God in our thoughts, but we are limiting what he can do. If this, is, if this cosmic cube philosophy is the way we're going to go, then God couldn't have created the heavens and the earth because he is part of the heavens and the earth. But God exists outside. Now, I have to admit, I was quite amused because I wanted to do a little bit more uh, investigation into the Cosmic Cube. Now, I went back and I found the video on YouTube for uh, week two, and I, I listened to it again a couple of times. I think I listened to the Cosmic Cube part a few more times than that because I really was trying to figure it out. And, but here's the thing, when I went to look up Cosmic Cube, the first umpteen pages of the, of the search came up with an overwhelming description. And here's the, the, the synopsis of that. The cosmic cube is a fictional object, I love that part, is a fictional object, but get this, appearing in American comic books published by Marvel Comics. Well, that works for me. Because if I, with my biblical worldview, that makes the cosmic cube fiction. And my search proved that up. The cosmic cube is a fictional object. I love that. It's so sad, though, that Sagan so easily latched on to mythology and science fiction and extraterrestrial life. I credit some youth leaders when I was a kid for helping me stay off one of those false paths. See, I had been given, because I'm born in May, I, and the time frame, if you subscribe to astrology, that puts me into a certain grouping. And someone had bought me a necklace with that symbol on it, and I went to youth group. I didn't leave with it on. 
I put it in my pocket, and I never wore it again. I don't even know what ever happened to it. But those youth leaders helped me to understand why that was a wrong path. I could have easily been sucked into the same thing that Carl Sagan was, into that mythology. But here's the thing. He comes from a Jewish family. Both his parents were Jewish. Now, his mom was more of a legalistic Jew, and she kind of, it was kind of more of a nationalism type thing. I am Jewish. It's almost like saying, I am American. So she didn't really subscribe to the scriptures of the Jewish faith. And his father, although growing up Jewish, he didn't subscribe to any of that at all. He's the one that really kind of started pointing Carl down that path of mythology and science fiction and ultimately. He was big into extraterrestrial life. He admits that the world was created by something, but he thinks it was extraterrestrial life. E.T. came into that. He rejected religion at a very early age. He said this, he said, in, in exactly that period when I was sort of seriously, so you get that sort of seriously? That just doesn't go together to me. But sort of seriously reading the Bible, I found in it all sorts of obvious contradictions contradictions with reality. Here's the problem. He was being influenced by his presuppositions, by his preconceived notions before that. The things in the world that had already sucked him in were changing the lens in which he was seeing through. So he was uh, falling victim to that pseudo-intellectual babble that we talked about a little bit ago. See, God is and he has revealed himself to us. We see this in the general revelation through our world, and specifically through the revelation of His Word. Now, I see God every day. On Thursday, we had an electrician come up, and we needed some work done. We we're having ceiling fans put in. He caught two things happened that day. He caught what should have been a house fire. All the wiring in our ceiling uh, ceiling fan was crispy. It was black. It was burned. He said the only reason he didn't have a fire is because his house was old enough to have had a metal box up there. So it just arced a little bit. So he got that cleaned up. And he was almost all done. And the air conditioning went out. Now, God picked that day for him to tell us he could come and do the electricity. So we have ceiling fans keeping us cool. And then what does God do? That 90 degree temperature, he turned down the dial. And it got cooler and cooler and cooler. This morning it was 67 degrees in our house because the windows are wide open. God is good. We had air conditioning. It wasn't the time we had to pay for either. But he revealed himself to us in that moment. By God's very nature, he is transcendent and imminent. In a blog post on Grand Canyon University's website, Amanda Jenkins explained it this way. She says, the transcendence of God means that God is outside of humanity's full experience, perception, or grasp. It tells me she, God is outside of that cosmic cube. The eminence of God means that he is knowable, perceivable, and graspable. We can know him, even though he's outside of that box. God is above works within the box all at the same time. Carl Sagan, like all of us, was looking for answers and he was looking for the meaning of life and unfortunately he was developing a philosophy that was not right. So what is philosophy? Let's dive into that a little bit more. Philosophy is the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. It's the basic beliefs, concepts, and attitudes of an individual or group of people. Now, Last week we went back to Webster's Dictionary from 1828. And it actually says literally the love of wisdom. That's what philosophy is. But in a modern acceptation, philosophy is a general term denoting an explanation of the reasons of things or an investigation of the causes of all phenomena, both of mind and matter. That's a good academic description of philosophy. There are different branches of philosophy, and when we talk about religion, philosophy then becomes theology. And all other philosophies 
I could we could go into them. I'm not going to because one, I'm not going to keep them here all day, and two, they don't matter beyond theology. True religion and true philosophy must ultimately arrive at the same principle. And if, in over the course of nearly 200 years, God has been removed not just from the definition of philosophy, but from every philosophy in general in the world. And without God in the mix, how are we supposed to answer the philosophical questions that are being asked? What is existence? What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? And I'm sorry, without God, these questions will go unanswered because only through God can we get the answers to those. So many people out there have a, something missing and they're constantly searching for it. They're looking for it through money. They're looking through it for through addictions, whether that's drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever. They're trying to fill that hole. And the only thing that can fill it is God. And that what they're looking for is some universal truth that can provide meaning to those particular questions. And they end up hopeless. And they're left trying to figure out what to do and what the truth is. They need to go back and listen to last month, last week's sermon and find out what truth is. If you haven't, go back and listen to it. In his search for the truth, Leonardo da Vinci. You know, and we think of, of all these things that he painted with angels and, and but no, he looked to mathematics and then science and then art. And guess what? He ended up empty. He died despondent and depressed deprived of any and all hope. How sad is that? In seeking the truth, people start to question what is right and what is wrong. And then they start asking the question, is there a right or wrong worldview? Is there a right or wrong way to look at the way the world is? Our biblical worldview tells us that there is one way to truth, and that is through Christ. It tells us that Jesus is the way the truth and the life and that no one can go before the Father except through Jesus. One path. Postmodernism, however, tells us that no one worldview or belief system can claim to be truth. There are many people out there, including pastors in the pulpit and Christian churches, that are saying, no, there's more than one way to go. This flies in the face of what we believe. So I have a question for you, another rhetorical question. Can you live with postmodernism? Now, let's define that a little bit. When someone who subscribes to postmodernism is faced with a biblical viewpoint, the response is often, well, that may be true for you, or that may work for you, but it, it just doesn't work for me. God is no longer the center of truth, and truth then becomes relative. We talked about that at the beginning. Go back to what is right, what is wrong. There are so many ethical implications to postmodernism that never would happen in the, the world. There is no basis for any ethical standards. Or well, for that matter, there's no basis for any ethical language. For those of us with a biblical worldview, ethics is based on moral ethics absolutes that are based on God's character. And since we are created in His image, that character then comes to us. Postmodern ethics say that there is no authority beyond yourself. Plato asks the question, is an act right because God said it? Or did God know it was right and told us about it? To this, Adam Phillips said, universal moral principles must be eradicated and reverence for individual and cultural uniqueness inculcated. That's kind of funny. In other words, reverence for individual and cultural uniqueness should be instilled by persistent instruction. Now, Jesus tells us that. Uh, parable about the persistent widow. That's not what this is. This is if we say, keep saying it over and over again, and we don't change the message, 
that eventually people are going to start believing it. Kind of had a little bit of a discussion like that before church this morning. And here's the thing, when that happens, there's a lot of discernment. We quit thinking for ourselves. Thomas Aquinas said this, he said, it is the task of the philosopher to make distinctions, meaning that truth is dependent on the ability to distinguish this from that. And this cannot be done if there is no absolute truth. And in postmodernism, there is no absolute truth. And without truth, we are left with chaos. And I think you've all seen a little bit of that over the last couple of years especially. There's been a lot of chaos because there is no absolute truth. And there is no basis in this instance for ethical standards or ethical language in a naturalistic worldview. I've got lots of questions for you today. What is your worldview? Have you fallen victim to this postmodernism view, even a little bit? Or do you have a biblical worldview? Do you ever find yourself saying, yes, but, but, yes, but, you're starting to fall into that postmodernistic view. What is keeping you from a consistent biblical worldview? I've got some things that might be doing that to you, and I'm going to run through those here real quick. Here's some things that keep us from being consistent uh, in our biblical worldview. Not being in God's Word every single day. If we're not in the Word, we can't know what it says. And if we don't know what it says, we can't develop a biblical worldview. And if that happens, then sometimes we can find ourselves rejecting what the Bible may say on certain issues. And then we become more concerned with the things of this world than what God thinks. Luke uh, records Jesus saying this in 12, 4, 5. He says, Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you than after that. But I tell you, whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into the hell. Yes, he's the one to fear. See, we may die. Somebody may kill us. There was a murder just within the last couple of days here. But after that, life ends eternity where? Pastor Mark. I get that in the quote. See, we can't be afraid of people because they will interfere, interfere with everything we do. What, if we're letting them interfere with everything we do, that fear grows. And at its most extreme, it can leave a person afraid to even leave their own home. Yet trusting in God leads to eternal life. Something else that can get in the way of having that consistency is having a half-hearted commitment to Jesus. go to church on Sunday, I go to Bible study on Wednesday, I'm good. But let you live your life every other minute of the week differently. Or the CE Christians, Christmas and Easter, half-hearted commitment to Jesus. Something else is being influenced by the lies of the world which ultimately come from Satan. We're not the only ones that succumb to this. It happened in the garden. This started at the very beginning. Adam and Eve succumbed to the lies. And if Satan can get us to see the Bible as a book of fairy tales, which a lot of people with a postmodernism view think the Bible is just a book of fairy tales or it's full of inconsistencies like Sagan thought, that causes you to start to question it. When Satan said, here, eat this fruit. It's good. It will... You won't die. You will be as smart as you know everything that God knows. He fed them a lie. And they fell into it. And when these things happen, we start to uh, not trust God's word and what he's saying to us. And we start to see it as obsolete and irrelevant. I'm sorry. The agricultural parables that Jesus used 
fit in that time frame, they still work today. They are timeless. So there's no way that they could be obsolete or irrelevant. And then the last one is, when our circumstances cause us to doubt God's promises. God, why did you allow this to happen? God, why did you take my infant baby from me? Then I'm reminded of Peter. Jesus is walking on the water and he's coming at him. And Peter, Peter says, tell me to come to you and I will. And he gets up and he starts whining. He's, well, the whole time he's focused on Jesus, what? Well, he's fine, right? But what happens as soon as he turns his eyes from him, he starts to sin. That's what happens when we keep our eyes off of God. And from, that keeps us from having that consistent biblical worldview. So why is that important? It's because our worldview governs every aspect of our lives. I heard a leader once say, I could separate my beliefs with what I do. I'm not sure how they did that unless he had split personality. That's not possible. My beliefs govern everything that I do. Yeah, do I stumble? Of course. Do I fall? Sometimes. God picks me back up and he sometimes uses my wife to do that. Pick me up off the floor, dust me off, and keep moving forward. Get our eyes back on the prize. Our worldview drives how we think, how we act, and how we feel. It's what we really believe. You can't separate them. It is impossible. So what's the solution? I'm done with the questions. Now an answer. The solution is a renewing of the mind. On Wednesday night, we heard the term metamorpho. That's another one that you got to try something three times fast. Metamorpho. It means to change into another form to transform or transfigure. First thing that I thought of when we were thinking and talking about this on Wednesday night or listening to this Wednesday night was the transfiguration where Jesus went up on the mountain. transformed. In Romans 12, Paul writes this. This comes to 12, 1 and 2. He says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. I hear this part don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, God has a perfect plan for your life. And that includes being transformed, renewed, and living a life that brings honor and glory to God. And this is regardless of what the world is telling us. God only, the world would tell you differently, but God only wants the best for you. If he didn't, he never would have sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to take our sins away from us, to make us holy, to make us uh, our, his children again. And since God did that for us, Shouldn't we be giving right back to him? Give, it says in the scripture, it says, give your bodies. This doesn't mean physically go and do a mission, God, a work, or do this or do that for the church. It means your whole body, your thoughts, and what you say, and what you do. It's everything. It's your whole person. And we have to be careful, because... Who doesn't know it's easy to fall back into your old ways? Some of you might not know this, but at one point in time, well, I, was, I smoked. And I tried umpteen times to quit. And I just couldn't. Because I had fallen back into my old ways. God set a set of circumstances up. And I was able to quit. Because I relied on him to, to help through it. Did we 
behaviors and customs of the world that Paul is warning us about are usually selfish, corrupted, and destructive. And even though we may physically avoid those things, we can still fall victim to other things like greed and being proud, being selfish and stubborn and arrogant. It is only when we allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds that we are truly transformed. Then we will live lives that are pleasing to God. So this takes us back to our call to worship this morning, Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. If we are thinking in our heart and making God the center of that, and God is in us, through us, through the Holy Spirit, us, us allowing him to dwell within us, then as we think in our hearts, so we are thinking as God would have us think. Father, we just thank you for this series that you have presented to us, that you are taking us through, Father, and how it is allowing us to grow, how it's helping us to see what the future, what truth truly is, and how we can have a biblical worldview, and how we can take that and live our lives pure and holy. Father, as we go through our lives and we do make mistakes, we will, Father, let us be repentant of those things that we are doing wrong. Change us, transform us through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Perry. As we come into this time of communion this morning, I want you to think about our philosophies and our ethics, you know, what governs our lives, what we think about governs our actions, what we have for our moral character, our ethics, what do we feel is ethical. And so God sent his son Jesus into the world to give us a living example of what we should be modeling in our lives, what we should be doing. Moreover, then, that, he said, okay, because of your sinful behavior, because of your separation from God, I'm going to send my son to die for you. Yesterday, I posted it up on Facebook, and if you haven't seen it, please go and take a look at it. But a physician once said that the, the best cure for an illness in a human being is love. And I think that really comes from God, because... Uh, the question that was asked to the doctor then, well, what if I have love and it's not enough? He says, then love even more. And that's exactly what God did when he sent Jesus to us. He sent Jesus to us because we were ailing, we were dying, we were dead to our sins. And he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, to take those sins, that illness, and and he took it to the cross. And he died for us. I want you to understand that that means more than just simply he died on the cross. He died for us, meaning he took our death from sin and placed it on the cross. He took our place. There's no greater love than that lays down his life for another. That's part of the scripture I quoted from John yesterday. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him with his whole body, with his whole being, will not perish, but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through. So as we come to this time of, of thanksgiving, as we come to this time of remembrance, we need to remember why Jesus went to the cross. How we are saved. We're no longer dead to our sins. 
through our faith in Christ Jesus. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he told the disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Take it. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it. And after he blessed it, he said, this is the cup, my blood shed for you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. The scriptures tell us that we are to do that until he comes again to take us to be back home. body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. When we come into our time of prayers with the people, we've got uh, several prayers to be lifted up. Um, I was talking with my boss earlier this week, and his father-in-law is suffering from esophageal cancer. And uh, so we want to lift him up through that because it was kind of metastasized in his system and it's starting to spread. So we need to lift him up uh, into the presence of Christ. Uh, Jim Cheney, who was in a motorcycle accident on Friday, uh, is going to take a lot to recover. Uh, He's got a lot of, a lot of injuries. Uh, a friend of mine uh, posted up all of the things yesterday morning, and I was sharing it with Pastor Terry, but the litany list of what he went through in that motorcycle class uh, is just horrific. Uh, his injuries are, are terrible. We really need to lift he and his wife up and, uh, and into our prayers and, and bring them into the presence of are there more people that we need to add to the list today? We have some people that are traveling. We ask for travel mercies for them and make sure that they have a, a good time with family and friends while they're there. Anyone else? Uh, how about blessing the families with uh, some of the shooting victims that's happened this week? Yes. Uh, we'll definitely lift up the, the families of the victims, the shooting victims this week. Uh, there was another shooting yesterday as well. Um, it seems like they're happening you know, multiple times a week now as people are getting more and more frustrated with what's going on in the world. And, and uh, I think we're going to see kind of an escalation of this, unfortunately, as we go forward as well. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, you are the great physician, and only you can heal spirits. Only you can heal in the way that needs to be healed. Lord, you know the healing that these people need. We lift them up to you, and to your care and comfort today. Lord, for those who are, are traveling, we ask for travel mercies to bring them back home safely and to bring them back into uh, our loving family as well. Lord, for those who are victims of senseless violence and meaning less violence out here. Lord, we lift them up to you right now. We lift the families up and we just ask, Lord, that you would intervene in this type of behavior, in this kind of worldview philosophy that separates people and separates their emotions from you. Lord, that keep them separated from your will and imposing their own instead. Lord, we ask that you would separate that from them and, and give them a clean heart and a pure heart so that they would not want to impose their will upon someone else's life. Father God, we lift all these things up. And we know that in all these things, your love is greater than anything that's going on in the world. We know that your power and your strength, through your Son, Jesus, can come into this world and change lives, change hearts, change behavior, transform people. So Lord, we just claim these victories in Jesus' name today. We claim on your scriptures, we claim on the truth of your word, 
that when we lift these things up with earnest hearts to you, Lord, you will answer this prayer. So we thank you and we claim these truths as well. In your precious and holy name. <laughs> Before we close out this portion of our service, the online portion, um, Becky meant to message this uh, through our chat on the live stream that her niece and her husband were in a motorcycle accident as well. So Sarah and Eugene uh, are getting their prayers as well. I came up here without everything I needed. be all that I need, right? <coughs> all the answers are in the book. <laughs> They're all here. I'm going to use, uh, before we close with the meditation today, as our prayer, the psalm, Psalm 63, it's the psalm of David, a uh, time when he was out in the wilderness in Judah. I'm going to change this just a little bit. I'm going to change the wording a little bit. In the, in the psalm that says, uh, you are my God. I'm going to make that plural. You are our God. So here, this psalm. Oh God, you are our God. We earnestly search for you. Our souls thirst for you. Our whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. We have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How we praise you. We will praise you as long as we live, lifting up our hands to you in prayer. You satisfy us more than the richest feast. We will praise you with songs of joy. Now hear these words from Paul as we prepare to end this section for Philippians 4 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. And think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. These are the things that will help you have a consistent biblical worldview and guide you how you should live your life. For those of you who are online, thank you for joining us. The videos that uh, we're going to be playing are already in the, the chat, so you can watch those alongside us as uh, we sing these songs.